Guys, give it up to band. Show the sound guys some love. They never get enough love back there. I love you, sound guys. You know it takes a lot of people to make this work. And they serve you guys selflessly. They pour their hearts out week after week for all the students that come. I mean, they're here for a long time. So uh, when you see one of the staff or maybe somebody came with you on the trip and they took their vacation days off of work so they could pour into your heart and minds, go easy on them, right? <laughs> I know it's the last night. You're going to want to stay up late. You're going to go hard, but go easy on them. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, they said, Kim, how come you didn't wear shoes yesterday on stage? I, I don't have my shoes on today either. Uh, it's fairly common for me to preach without my shoes on, um, right? This is uh, the ninth time that I've preached on this stage. And so one day, Moses is walking along in the hills that he's walked all the time. It's very common and familiar to him, and God said, Moses, take off your sandals. Because where you're walking is holy ground. Even though he had already been there, and he had walked it a hundred times before, God shows up, and when God shows up, it makes him holy. So you're going to go back home tomorrow to a familiar place, a place and a home and a town that you walked a hundred times before, but this time let God show up and make it holy. Even though you might go back to the same old routine, you don't have to just go on your own. We'll go with God. Amen? Okay, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we've been able to gather this week and just praise your name. God, I, I am the least worthy person to communicate your goodness and grace and love. But Father, it's those very attributes that you possess that allow me to be up here. You've shown me grace. You've shown me patience. You've shown me love. So Father, I just hope tonight that in a small way I can reflect that to the people around me. God, give me strength. All God's people said... Thank you. When I was, I don't know, I want to say like 13 or 14 years old, my dad is a missionary, right? So right now he's in Budapest, Hungary, and he's going to come home for a few weeks and he's going to the Gambia. If you're interested at all in short-term summer missions, and missions is one of the themes that we've been talking about, you can go to allstar.org, that's A-W-E-S-T-A-R.org, and we offer trips all year round that help students your age, 13 years old and older, go on short-term missions projects. Well, he's there right now, and I used to travel with him quite a bit. And uh, in the summer, we would go for about a month to Hungary, and then we would get on a train. It was an overnight train ride, and we would go to Grindelwald, Switzerland. And Grindelwald, Switzerland is right at the bottom of the Eiger Mountain, the Swiss Alps. It's some of the most beautiful places you've ever been. And we did a camp just like this. My dad was a speaker, and I got to hang out with students just like you. And there was a girl at this camp who happened to catch my eye. Her name was Mandy, and I was smitten, right? I mean, it is so easy to fall in love in Switzerland. I remember Mandy and I, we were holding hands and we're walking over this wooden bridge and underneath is this white, freezing, cold, rapid water. And in the background are mountains and doves landed on my shoulders. Okay, that part didn't happen, but, but it, it seemed like it was something out of a Disney movie, right? And here I was, a young boy, and I had found my one. And every year I would go back and there would be... And in between, because email had not been invented yet, we had to write letters. Letters is when you take a piece of paper and you write, and then a stamp. A stamp is a small square that you lick, and then you attach to it, and somehow it magically shows up. Um, but we would write letters back and forth to each other all year long. She was my pen pal. And what we would talk about is how we couldn't wait till the summer. Uh, we, the camp we did was for military kids stationed overseas in Europe. And her dad was stationed in Europe, and every year it was the highlight of my summer to be able to reach my little hand out and hold Mandy's hand once again. 
She was a year older than me, because I'm cool like that. Uh, and uh, so she graduated high school before I did. And so my last year of high school, I was working at McDonald's. I started off cleaning dishes, I moved up to fries, and eventually I made it all the way to cheeseburgers, right? And I saved every dime I had so that I could fly and go see Mandy on my own. She had moved back to the States. Her dad got restationed in Washington, and I was like, I can afford that plane ticket. It was going to cost me about $500 round trip. But I saved every dime, and I would write the letters telling her how close it was to we were reunited. And I, in my young mind, A, I had to beg my parents to allow this to happen, but in my mind, I thought that I was going to maybe propose. But I was so certain that she was the one. I was willing to save every dime. All my friends are spending their money on cool stuff, and I couldn't do anything. Oh, but Mandy was worth it to me. So I saved every dime, and I got on that plane, and I remember just like the butterflies in your stomach. You know what that's like, right? Where you just get these butterflies, just the thought of seeing them. And I couldn't wait, and I showed up at the airport and gave her a big hug, and we got in the car, and she began to tell me all about her new boyfriend. Crack, right? Just split right down the middle, and I was there for a week, just like. I'm sure he's a real great guy. How much money did he save to come see you, right? But there's something about love that makes us want to traverse great distances, doesn't it? Love is willing to travel. Like if you were loved with somebody and they lived down the block, you'd be like, yeah, but it's a block, right? Then you're not really in love with them. My wife, Adrian, raise your hand. Say, we love you, Adrian. We love you, Adrian. Right? She's gorgeous. Um, she's my rock. And I met her, and shortly after I met her, I went on a mission trip. There were no like unlimited texting back in the day, and it was going to cost me for every single text that I sent overseas. But because she was worth it, I didn't care how far away I was or how much it was going to cost me. I was going to stay in touch with her all day long in case some better looking, taller guy would have moved in while I was away, right? And when I got back, my texting phone bill was over $200 just in text alone. But because I loved her, the distance was worth it. Any married guys here testify to that? Right? Yeah. You have to, right? You have to. If they're here, you'd be in trouble. So what I want to talk about tonight is along that line about love traveling great distances. Have you ever thought where Jesus was before he entered into the womb of Mary. Where was Jesus before he entered into the womb of Mary? If you got your Bible, turn to John, the 17th chapter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Hopefully you can count to 17. Mark, Luke, and John. If you got it, say, I got it. Get it? Got it? Good. All right, let's read. And now, this is Jesus talking. You know how I know that? It's red. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So while Jesus is on earth, part of his prayer, one of the things he is praying to God is he's saying, God, I can't wait to get back to where I was before I came here. And one of the claims that make Jesus unique, he claims to be equal with the Father. Now remember, I told you the other day that God shares his glory with no one, right? 
This is what it says in Scripture, that God shares his glory with no one. But Jesus says, God shared his glory with me. How can he do that? Well, Jesus is God. So Jesus, before he entered into the womb of Mary, is God on the throne. He's one part of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And he's sharing equal glory and praise. That means any time someone prayed to God, Jesus was there to hear it. Any time somebody worshipped God, Jesus was there to hear it. While God is in heaven, do you think the angels are arguing with him? Do you think he's under any kind of threat or stress? Do you think while Jesus is on his throne as God, if he's hungry, he has to ask anyone for anything? If he even gets hungry, who knows? Does he need anything from anyone? No. Scripture tells us that all things were created by him, for him, and through him. Jesus has created everything, and now he stepped down onto this earth. So what I want you to think about in your mind is think about what that looked like that second, that nanosecond, that Jesus got off his throne. And what kind of distance did he travel? He left his throne and he entered into the womb of Mary. Nine months later, God is born in the flesh. God has to cry when he's hungry. He went from totally independent to totally dependent. God has to be changed. God is going to hit teenage years and get acne, and his voice is going to change. And then at 30 years old, God begins his ministry. And he starts letting people know, by the way, I am the I am. If you want to know what God looks like, look at me. I'm the image of the invisible God. And everyone starts to mock him. Everyone starts to laugh at him. Everyone makes fun of him, even his own family sometimes think, what are you, crazy? you possessed by a demon? They're like, "You're, you're going to get yourself killed with that kind of talk. He goes and he finds a few fishermen and he begins to continue this message and eventually this message gets him killed. Turn with me to Mark. 15. Verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And some ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when Centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. So here's here's the bookends to God's life. The creator of the universe enters into our world amongst the pain and blood of childbirth and he dies amongst the pain and blood of crucifixion and in between it's nothing but being misunderstood. This is the way the world treats a king. This is the way our world treats God. This is the way the world treats our creator. This is the way the world treats the greatest love we'll ever know. And I used to ask myself, Why was it that God traveled such a great distance from his throne in heaven to the womb of Mary? 
Why would God travel such a distance? Well, the truth is, is that's how far away you are from God. That's how far away I was from Him. But that's also how much He loved me. That He would travel such a great distance. I know what it means to be that far away from God. I don't know if you know that. I don't know if you know what it means to be that far away from God to realize your own brokenness and sinfulness. I haven't told you much of my testimony yet. You've heard bits and pieces, and I'll just give you a few more pieces. Um, at the age of 18, as soon as I graduated high school, I moved to California. I'd already been involved in drugs and alcohol at that point in my life, and I was going to be a movie star. That was my idea, and all I did was get involved with more drugs and alcohol. When I moved back to Oklahoma, I didn't really want to work. I thought I was better than everybody else, and I didn't want just a small paying job, I wanted to make a lot of money, so I became a drug dealer. I was one of the top five drug dealers in my city that I lived in. I had my own house. At the age of 19, I had my own house in a Porsche 944. And I, I like to brag that I had all this stuff, but I was miserable on the inside. I have all my journals from those days. And everybody thought I was a fun party guy, but in my journals, all I wrote about is how miserable I was. See, when I had walked away from God and became an atheist, I also walked away from all the godly morality that my parents had taught me. And it was free reign. I was allowed to do and chase whatever pleasures I wanted to chase. And guess what? I chased those pleasures, and I was more miserable than I'd ever been in my life. Because I was miserable, I kept trying to self-medicate, so more drugs, more alcohol, more drugs, more alcohol. I got arrested a couple of times for driving under an influence. I took away my license. I got arrested again. Driving under influence with no license, they put me in jail for a little bit. When I got out, I had no more job. I couldn't sell drugs anymore. I was on probation. If I got caught, I was going to do another 30 years. I didn't want that, so I, I had to figure out another way to make money, so I started waiting tables. I had to sell my car. I had to get rid of the house because I had all these lawyer and court costs that I had to pay. So I found myself this one guy who used to be extremely popular and extremely fun and living the life that everybody in the world said I should be living, taking the city bus waiting tables. I was working at a little Mexican restaurant, and across the street was a pool hall that I spent most of my days at. So I would go to whatever money I made at the restaurant in the morning for lunch. I would go to the pool hall, and I would play pool and drink. And then after I'd run out of money, I would go back to work, and I'd work another shift or two, and whatever tips I made, I would take that night, and I would just go back over the pool hall, and I would play pool and drink. And that became my entire life. All my friends were drunk friends. And that's all we did, is we drank. And I became a severe alcoholic, to the point to where if I didn't have a drink, I would start to get the shakes. I'm not even 20 years old. And alcohol is beginning to ruin my body that without it, I'm trembling. And so, one day, I'm finishing up my lunch shift, and uh, I'm about to go to the pool hall, and I'm, I'm really needing, it's been a stressful morning, and I was really craving that drink, and my hands are starting to shake, and my boss comes to me and says, hey, uh, Caleb, I know you're about to leave, but I need you to go get this guy's drink order. Well, I already clocked out, I was done. I folded all the little silverware and the napkins that I was supposed to do. I had my pile, I was done. I said, boss, I really don't want to, I gotta go. And he goes, Caleb, it's, it's just a drink. It won't take you long, you don't have to wait on him, just go get his drink. So, fine, I grab my pad and pen, and I go over to the guy, and I go, hi, what can I get you? I see Dr. Pepper, Mountain Dew, Sprite. And he looks at me. And he just keeps looking. I was like, would you like a margarita? He just keeps looking at me. In my mind, I'm like, great, this guy's hitting on me. <laughs> Sir, iced tea, sweet, unsweet, water? Speak English, right? I don't, I don't know what's going on. And he goes, look, I'm, I'm sorry. He goes, this is really, really awkward. He says, I promise I don't ever say anything like this. And I could see there's like a tremble in his lips, and he's nervous to say it. And he goes, this is going to sound crazy, but I feel like God's trying to Tell me to tell you something? I said, oh, great, it's one of those charismatics. 
like, man, I've dealt with these guys before. Don't worry. I have a wall built up for every religious argument. I might be an atheist, but I'm an educated atheist, and I know all the church games. I've been to camp a billion times. I knew all the things they're going to say. He's going to threaten me with hell. He's going to do all this stuff. I know all the arguments. So bring it on, church boy. I got, I'm ready to go. You want to fight? I'll fight, especially when I'm hungry for a drink. He says, I feel like God is trying to tell me to let you know he's not mad at you. Why are you so mad at him? And I said, well, say that again. He says, God's not mad at you. Why are you mad at him? How do you know he's not mad at me? I hate myself. Nobody, nobody could love me like that. That love doesn't exist. That's, that's a lie. You're lying. You're a liar. And I began to just weep. I went back to the back office, and I'm like just bawling my eyes out, and I call my mom and say, Mom, I need you to come pick me up. I didn't go to the pool hall that day. I went home, and I reached under the bed, and there was bottles all underneath my bed because I couldn't fall asleep unless I was drinking. And I scooted all those bottles aside, and I could see it far back there in the corner. I reached back there, and I pulled out my Bible that my parents had given me. I set it on the bed, and I opened it. And I just started to soak the pages. I don't even remember what I read, but I said, God, if you love me that much, I'll do whatever you want. I'll do whatever you ask me to. See, I had been running and running and running and running and running as hard as I could, but I could not run the grace of God and neither can you. How far of a distance did Jesus travel? He made it all the way to that restaurant. So a little punk had been running as hard as he possibly could. This story this is where I really want to drive home tonight. God came that far, became flesh. He taught some disciples. By no means were these guys, and we, we, we always think, when you picture the disciples, don't you picture older guys with beards? You know a lot of them around like the age of 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. The disciples were not old guys. They weren't the best of the best. For the most part, they're uneducated. I don't know if they could tie their shoes or not, right? But God picks them because they're lowly. And he says, watch what I can do with nobodies. And that message and Jesus' picking of those disciples was so effective that 2,000 years that message had landed in that restaurant in front of me. Think about the distance this message has had to travel over generations. It leaves the Middle East, it gets on boats, and it goes through alleys and back rooms, and it's illegal for a, a large portion of our history. And the early Christians, they were dipped in oil and set on fire to light pagan parties. It used to be if you claimed to be a Christian, that was basically your death sentence. But they kept talking about the message because it was that good. See, it had made it to their feet and they found freedom. And if you've been rescued, the immediate job of somebody who's been rescued is to rescue the person next to you. Rescued people, rescue people. Say that with me. Rescued people, rescue people. If you've been rescued, it's time to start rescuing those around you. See, that's how it's made it this far. Not because of television, not because of the internet, the reason this message has continued to travel is because it changes people's lives. If that man had not been brave enough to muster up that awkward courage, because it's always awkward to start talking about this stuff, but if he had to said something to me, I'd probably be dead now. I'd probably just drank myself to death and killed myself. Because I was getting there. I was getting there. I had nothing. 
Look, what, look how far he's brought. I don't have a college education. I have no seminary. I'm not a professional. But the grace of God is so transformative. It takes this prideful, angry, ignorant little punk. And he blessed me with the opportunity to share this message with thousands of people. And the only thing I know how to do is take little, bitty, tiny steps of obedience. I'm not out there making some great leaps and bounds, just showing off my spiritual superiority. You heard me talk. I'm just taking pizza because I don't know what to do. It's awkward for me still. I embrace the awkwardness because I want my story to inspire you to begin to tell more stories. Can you imagine this? I knew I should have told this story with a Kleenex in my pocket, right? Because I'm up here just wiping boogers away. Can I tell you what keeps me up at night? And what makes me afraid? Is that that story has traveled from heaven, from Mary's womb, to the birth of Jesus, to the disciples, from continent continent, over oceans, down railways, down roads, through tunnels, through caves, all for the last 2,000 years, and it's going to stop at your feet and go no further. What a shame if that message makes it all the way here, this is the generation that goes, eh. And it just dies at your feet. You know, there's places throughout the world right now where the gospel is exploding, and it's normally in places where Christians are being persecuted. Because those are the people that have to take their faith seriously. Either you're in or you're out. And if you're in, please be in. Remember, one of the reasons that I walked away from the faith is because I had a Sunday school teacher who was a Christian, but couldn't bother to answer real questions, so I walked away. He was in, but he wasn't in. So if you're going to be in this faith, Please pick up that mantle of responsibility. Take that torch home. Take off your sandals on that familiar ground and make it holy ground. And share that message with the people around you. If your God experience stays here at this God camp, then what was the point? Were you just wasting your time? Was it just a fun weekend with friends? God experiences are meant to be shared. God experiences are meant to be retold. I'm going to ask you this. Short sermon tonight. I'm going to make it real simple, real clear. I want you to think right now in your mind of one person that you need to talk to when you get home. Are you thinking? Think the name of one person you need to talk to when you get home. Somebody over here, tell me a name. Colton? Heavenly Father, we pray right now that Colton would be responsive to the message. We pray that when his friend tells him about the truth and love and mercy of Christ, he would respond with an open heart. Somebody else, tell me a name. Michael, Heavenly Father, we ask right now that you would begin to move in Michael's life and that he would not fight against you anymore, but he would hear the truth of the gospel and his life would be changed. Tell me another name. Trinity, Heavenly Father, what a coincidence that somebody named Trinity might not accept the Trinity, but God, that's going to end when she gets home and she shares with him how far you have traveled for her. Tell me another name. Hayden, Heavenly Father, we ask that Hayden would be a child of Christ adopted into your family. Another name. Landon, Heavenly Father, we ask for Landon that you would begin to move in a mighty way. That Landon would no longer be lost, but would be found. Would no longer be a prisoner, but be free. Give me a name. Elliot, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would move in Elliot's life. That whatever has been keeping Elliot away from you, that those barriers would be broken down and no wall would be strong enough to keep out that Holy Spirit. One more name. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we pray for Austin. 
Austin's been running from you. Austin's scared of looking uncool. Austin, whatever it is that he's dealing with that keeps you apart from him, let that end as soon as they get home. The first phone call they make is let me tell you what great things God has done in my life. And I just had to tell you, God loves you regardless of what you've done in the past. Now, I pray for him. Now, you pray for him. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, as soon as we all stand up to sing, the counselor is going to go off to the side. You just go off and you just go visit with him and say, look, I don't know. I don't know if I even believe this. If you don't believe it yet, that's fine. Talk to him about it. But hopefully you've seen and heard enough stories about how good God is that it should begin to make you question if this is real. Let us talk to you about whether it's real or not.